Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the third and final session of this year's ANU Japan Update. Uh, my name is Lauren Richardson, and I'm a lecturer in the Department of International Relations at ANU. Um, as we commence tonight, I would like to acknowledge and celebrate the, the first Australians from who, whose traditional lands this webinar is being streamed and pay our respect to the elders present and um, past and present. Um, so tonight's event is being recorded. Um, as you know, um, for those who have joined us from um, the original session, we first looked at Japan's response to the coronavirus from a domestic perspective. Um, we then moved on to look at the economic impact of the coronavirus on, on Japan. And in tonight's, se um, tonight's session, we'll be looking at how the pandemic has shaped Japan's um, foreign and security policy. Um, I think that when the, the pandemic first started and we saw the, the lockdown in, in Wuhan, China, I think none of us could have predicted um, how extensive um, the, the spread of the virus would be. And also that we couldn't have imagined how much it would shape uh, the regional order and also the global order. Um, we've seen a lot of intensification of diplomatic um, friction in the region. And because Japan has been playing such a big role in the region, a major role under the Abe administration, um, there are very significant implications for Japan. Um, so as with the previous night's um, panels, we've amassed um, or assembled um, a stellar panel of experts um, to help us unpack the dynamics of the pandemic and how, how they've shaped Japan's foreign and security policy. Um, and it's not just the pandemic, of course, we've also had the, the bombshell announcement of Prime Minister Abe's resignation, which is very much the end of an era um, for Japanese politics. So we'll, of course, be reflecting on that um, tonight. Um, so our panelists have joined us from Keio University, Murdoch University and the National Institute for Defence Studies in Japan. I'll be introducing them all um, in order that they speak. Uh, the format for tonight's session will be slightly different um, than previous sessions. Our panelists will not be using um, PowerPoint. Um, their presentations will be slightly shorter than previous nights. And we're really hoping that um, audience questions will drive our analysis and our discussion. So I, I strongly encourage you all um, to start sending through your questions as soon as um, they arise <laughs> in your minds and we'll get through as many of them as we can. Our session tonight is one and a half hours. Um, we will be finishing on time. Um, so very excited um, to dive into the topics. Our first speaker tonight um, perhaps needs no introduction. We have um, Yoshihide Soya, uh, who is Professor Emeritus at Keio University. Um, so after retiring um, as a professor um, from Keio last um, March in 2020, um, well, he's, he's up until that point had a, a really um, stellar career as an academic. Um, he's, his expertise includes the politics and security um, environment of East Asia and Japanese diplomacy and its external relations. Um, he holds a PhD from University of Michigan um, and he served as the director of the Institute of East Asia Studies at Keio University for six years and director of its Center for Contemporary Korean Studies um, for five years. So Professor Sawyer will be um, looking at Japan's um, current strategic setting in Northeast Asia and um, we'll also reflect on Abe um, as a politician and policymaker, and we'll also look at the Indo-Pacific. So thank you, Professor Sawyer, for joining us tonight. Hey, th thank you, Lauren, for all your kind introduction. And uh, I would like to thank the organizer for inviting me to this annual uh, Japan Update conference. Uh, of course, I wish I could have gone to Canberra uh, for, for the meeting, but uh, uh, because of the, the, yeah, the not well-known problem, uh, I'm speaking uh, from my residence. Uh, incidentally, background is not my residence. Uh, those who are familiar with Mita campus, this is one of the buildings on 
uh, Mita campus uh, called Enzetsukan, where Fukuzawa started the practice of speech uh, uh, after opening up of the country. Uh, I, I like this picture, uh, that's, that's, that's why I use it as a background. Well, uh, in my uh, short presentation, uh, uh, let me talk about basically three things. Uh, one is the current strategic environment, uh, which is not any news to, I think, the audience and, and everybody. Uh, but secondly, a little bit of reflection upon uh, Abe's uh, policies and how I see them. And I will end with the usual topic uh, on the Indo-Pacific, the importance of uh, this, this kind of regional uh, uh, concept. And uh, maybe I don't have to spend much time in talking about uh, the US-China rivalry, uh, but one thing which I wanna stress is the kind of the nature of Chinese increasing assertiveness, uh, which uh, cannot be accounted for necessarily by kind of tra traditional West, Western-centered uh, international uh, theories. And uh, recent behaviors of China seems to signal its you know, strong determination to so-called, so, so, so and so recover its traditional sphere of influence uh, commensurate to its power in Asia and maybe beyond. And the enactment of the Hong Kong national security law on June 30th would virtually mean, very unfortunately, an end to Hong Kong uh, political autonomy and maybe democracy. But uh, many would also worry uh, its tacit but intrinsic in linkage with Beijing's Taiwan policy over the very long run, uh, which is compounded by the steady buildup of Chinese anti-access, anti-denial capabilities against the possible U.S. military intervention. And the United States sees a Chinese assertiveness as a challenge to the U.S. primacy in the Indo-Pacific, as well as a danger to democratic institutions and values uh, domestically and externally. And uh, the United States, well, many, many observers point out that a pandemic caused by the COVID-19 simply adds to complication of the bilateral relationship and accelerates its uh, rivalry. If left unattended, the impact of deteriorating US-China relations on the future of a regional order in the Indo-Pacific will be twofold. First, to the extent that the US-China confrontation keeps getting intensified, the space for independent action of countries in the region will continue to shrink. Second, the COVID-19 pandemic has caused many countries to tighten their border control and opt for national actions to cope with the spread of the virus, discouraging them from thinking and acting regionally and globally. And as a result, regional countries are being pressed into the situation of having to choose sides between the United States and China. And in order to avoid this loss of autonomy on our part, the revitalization of multi -co multilateral cooperation in the Indo-Pacific is in dire need. And I'll come, come, come back to this point uh, later. Uh, but before that, a little bit on uh, Prime Minister Abe, uh, who announced resignation uh, in uh, late uh, August. Well, uh, people ask a question whether Prime Minister Abe is an ideologue or a realist. And uh, in fact, I think uh, he is both. And uh, Mr. Abe has, has had strong preoccupation with some of the ideological core agenda for him, including the revision of post-war constitution in general, and that of the war renouncing Article 9 in particular, and educational reforms, and the role and the place of the memories of history in the post-war Japanese society and, and the politics, as well as among Japanese neighbors. And Prime Minister Abe uh, dubbed this core agenda as a departure from the post-war regime, whose ultimate goal is 
according to his own term, uh, words, recover true independence by creating the core structure of the state from scratch by the hands of the Japanese people. And some of the foreign policy agenda of Prime Minister Abe reflected some aspects of these rather ideological beliefs, which have naturally caused friction, mostly with Japan's immediate neighbors, such as China and South Korea. Other policies, however, that do not have much discord with this core agenda have been advanced more or less within the post-war parameters of Japanese diplomacy, uh, where many observers characterize Mr. Abe as being realistic. And I think both of these were true uh, in his uh, policy performances. But still, the third, a bit more complex and, and the difficult uh, type of Abe's diplomacy uh, comes from a mixture of these two categories and whose origin could be rather ideological but the outcome is realistic in the sense that it falls within the framework of Japanese uh, uh, diplomacy. And in my observation and analysis, value-based diplomacy of the first Abe administration and the 2015 security legislation under the second administration and free and open Indo-Pacific strategy are three typical cases belonging to this third category. And of course, for the lack of time, I will skip the first two agenda and come to uh, FIOP. Excuse me, oh, it's here. Well, uh, it is widely believed uh, that uh, my papers, oh, it's here, sorry. That FIOP ad advocated by Japanese Prime Minister uh, Abe is indeed a counter strategy against Belt and Road Initiative of China. In mid 2018, however, the Abe administration stopped calling this initiative strategy and instead labeled it a vision. And this decision coincided with Abe's official visit to China in October 2018, which were the first one by the Japanese Prime Minister in the previous seven years. Abe met with President Xi Jinping and the Premier Liu Chang, and confirming that the bilateral relationship was now back to a normal track. Since then, Xi Jinping's state visit to Japan became an important agenda and it was once agreed that she would visit Japan in the spring of this year, which is now being postponed due to COVID-19 turmoil. And as a result, Japanese vision of FIO was now reverted to a virtual rebranding of the long-held Japan's regional policies since the end of the Cold War, including the reaffirmation of the merits of ASEAN-centered processes and, and the limitations, uh, institutions, I'm sorry. And in June 2019, ASEAN itself adopted the ASEAN outlook on Indo-Pacific and virtually declared that an, the ASEAN way is still effective in managing cooperation in the Indo-Pacific. A central element of the ASEAN way is the inclusiveness of the membership of the ASEAN-centered institutions. Uh, in my view, this, however, now could work as a double-edged sword under the intensifying US-China rivalry. Inclusiveness is an important precondition for cooperative security, but could become a venue for big powers to control other smaller members. In fact, differing attitudes of ASEAN member states toward China and perhaps to the US too, have already weakened ASEAN solidarity. And against these backgrounds, I have been emphasizing uh, in, in recently the importance of cooperation among other states uh, being in a way sandwiched between China and the United States other than uh, ASEAN and most notably Japan, Australia and India. And there has been a series of bilateral agreement uh, between uh, you know, these two countries and but one important phenomenon that I'd like to uh, leave you with is a new development uh, which is an inception as of an official 
Japan, Australia, India dialogue uh, by vice ministers of uh, foreign affairs of these uh, three countries. And uh, in 2015, 20, and, well, there are four rounds of trilateral vice minister meetings among Japan, India, and Australia. And uh, I, I was just recently told by a, a official of Australian embassy in Tokyo that just recently there was exactly the same trilateral setting imposed uh, among officials of economic ministries of these three countries. And they were talking about you know, strengthening and uh, reforming supply chains in, in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, among among the three countries, and so uh, I think there, there there is a foundation upon which you know these you know core members of the Indo-Pacific countries, aside from ASEAN, uh, can work together and build cooperation. And one significant phenomena of the outcome of these dialogues among the three members is the reaffirmation of ASEAN centrality, and uh, so which which might I think suggest that eventually, you know, ASEAN's experience is a long tested merits of regional cooperation could be reinforced by newly emerging cooperation among these other members of the Indo-Pacific. So I, I will stop here and look forward to uh, questions and discussions. Thank you very much, Professor Sawyer. It was wonderful to get that um, broad overview of the region and what's what's going on. And I should also mention to the audience that Professor Sawyer has a, a great new opinion article um, on this topic where he, he lays a, a framework for cooperation between Australia, um, India, South Korea and Japan in the latest edition of the East Asia Forum Quarterly. Um, so it's good to see some questions coming through already and I should also mention that um, we're happy to receive comments as well. I know there's a lot of people who have views on this debate about whether Prime Minister Abe is more of a pragmatist or an ideologue. Um, so feel free to send through uh, your comments as well. So our next speaker this evening is, um, I'm delighted to introduce, is Professor Ricky Kirsten. Um, who's an emeritus professor at Murdoch University. Um, she previously held the position of executive director of the Asia Research Institute at Murdoch. Um, and prior to this served as interim pro-vice chancellor of the College of the Arts at Murdoch um, and is Dean of Arts from 2014 to 2019. Um, Professor Kirsten also held teaching and research positions at the University of Sydney, Leiden, Keio, Tokyo and the ANU, where she was also Dean of the College of the Asia and the Pacific. Um, um, Professor Kirsten is also a former Australian diplomat um, to, to, to Japan and her research interests uh, focus on Japanese history, politics, security policy and foreign policy. So tonight um, we're delighted that um, Professor Kirsten is going to talk about how COVID is going to affect Japan's, um, post, Japan's security thinking in the post Abe era. Thanks very much, um, Ricky. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Lauren, for that generous introduction. And I'd, I'd like to start by bouncing off um, Professor Sawyer's presentation. This uh, fascinating dichotomy uh, within Prime Minister Abe's um, policy orientation that you referred to, the ideological uh, versus the practical, the realistic or the pragmatic. Um, I, I wondered if uh, when we're done with the presentations, whether you could um, explain why it is that the ideological elements in Prime Minister Abe's uh, policy orientation um, can actually end up damaging Japan's national interest without it uh, appearing to him to violate uh, the practical, realist or pragmatic aspects of his thought. How can um, this be rationalised by uh, Prime Minister Abe? And I'm particularly thinking of Japan 
um, ROK relations in that respect. So I'd be very keen to hear uh, Professor Sawyer's thoughts on that. But as uh, Lauren just indicated, I'd like to just consider um, how COVID has affected um, Japan, but particularly how it might impact a post Abe security policy environment. The first point I'd like to make is I think it's very important that we don't confuse uh, Prime Minister Abe's ideological and policy ambition with actual achievements. However, at the same time, we shouldn't assume that the failure to achieve major policy ambitions on his part means that significant change did not occur in the security or foreign policy realms, because I believe such change has occurred. The questions that um, I'd like to uh, address are whether Abe did achieve a significant normative shift regarding security and foreign policy um, in Japan or indeed elsewhere. And consider how COVID has impacted the security environment during the transition to the post Abe administration, which is where we are currently at. The COVID impact, I think, uh, just to deal with this quite quickly, um, I think it's being um, analysed uh, around the world in a quite similar way. And Professor Sawyer also uh, referred to this. First of all, um, there's an evident inwards focus uh, where political competence of leaders are judged according to their domestic COVID management. And this um, has consequential, consequential impacts on the uh, trust that is um, evident between civil society and the political leadership of um, countries. And this is uh, very much the case in Japan. And the inwards focus is also evident in more attention being paid on a sovereign manufacturing autonomy as a priority in strategic thinking. A second impact of COVID uh, is that it's a massive distraction. It's distracting regional powers and it provides room, I think, for opportunistic disruption by malign entities. Uh, I think uh, as a result of this, there's an increased need for collaborative surveillance, monitoring and information sharing at a time when national resources are stretched. So um, we should be looking for an awareness and a commitment that the strategic requirements um, that I've just outlined are really quite important despite the um, pandemic uh, being currently the dominant uh, political uh, concern. I think another impact of COVID is that it provides opportunity, uh, particularly to demonstrate the utility and social good of military collaboration at home and abroad by engaging in COVID relief diplomacy. And we've seen this happening in a kind of uh, competitive way, uh, including uh, between uh, Japan and China in their international uh, pandemic aid initiatives. As Professor Sawyer has already outlined, another impact of COVID in terms of strategic impact is the intensification of US-China strategic competition is, is now occurring with um, a strong um, rhetorical element. Um, for example, the Wuhan virus. And this is making uh, quite clear to uh, all of 
US allies and security partners, as Professor Sawyer said, that the prospect of being forced to choose sides is becoming just that much closer. And so if we consider this COVID impact, in this environment, I think we've seen Prime Minister Abe redouble his efforts to strengthen regional security relations, right up until um, the announcement of his uh, retirement or resignation. And this is particularly important when we consider the attention that Prime Minister Abe has personally paid and the initiatives he has led with respect to bilateral Japan-India security relations. And I think uh, from looking at this through a COVID lens, uh, we could see that this may have the potential to mitigate this absolute choice conundrum that is emerging as a result of US-China uh, strategic competition. If, if I turn to Abe's normative legacy, I think the first thing that comes to mind is that Prime Minister Abe has convincingly established Japan's place as a country that wants to and does see itself as the guardian of liberal internationalism. Now, there's a lot of things we can say about that, um, providing a contrast with uh, or implying a contrast with China being one of the things, but there is ballast here. Um, Abe's initiative salvaging the TPP, uh, the Free and Open Indo-Pacific Initiative, Defence Aid and Capacity Building in ASEAN, the Quality Infrastructure Initiative in the G20. All of these things give real heft to a claim that Japan is acting as a guardian of liberal internationalism uh, at the very least in the Indo-Pacific and Asia-Pacific region. If uh, we continue to consider a normative legacy, it's also true if we look at um, the Pew um, survey results that Japan is more trusted than strategic competitors in its region uh, particularly uh, Southeast Asian nations trust Japan more than they trust, for example, China. And this credibility that Japan has is considerably enhanced by the creation of a solid security policy-making bureaucracy in the form of the National Security Council, the whole of government coordination that it achieves, and the fact that this will be a legacy of Prime Minister Abe's. In other words, he has institutionalised a strengthened security policy-making capability in contemporary Japan. Another legacy we can refer to is that I think Prime Minister Abe has enabled uh, in the establishment or the creation of international security networks to be better accepted in Japan as a force for stability in the world and in the region. Yes, it's about counterbalancing China um, in the main. It's also about spreading the risk of a less engaged US but it certainly isn't about hedging against US withdrawal from the region. And I think that's an important point to make. Continuing to look at the normative legacy, we are today uh, witnessing a discussion in Japan about whether and how Japan should engage in force pr projection under very specific conditions and constraints 
uh, especially since the cancellation of the Aegis Ashore commitment. But it's unavoidable that we also observe that part of Abe's normative legacy is that any evolution in Japan's security posture um, must be framed in terms that appropriate or reflect the still dominant pacifist sentiment in Japanese public opinion. So what I think Abe has achieved is that he has identified a pathway between residual pacifist norms and security imperatives. In other words, he, is help, he has helped to articulate the norms of a constrained pacifist power. In terms of post-Abe, these are the opportunities and threats that I think emerge in a post-Abe policy, security policy environment in Japan. Clearly, there's an opportunity to reset problem areas that strategically weaken Japan and the efficacy of the alliance with the US. And again, I'm thinking of Japan are ROK relations here, but Japan-China relations are also um, significant. Another opportunity, and Professor Sawyer alluded to this, is the opportunity to consolidate the strategic momentum that Prime Minister Abe established, particularly in engaging India in the security arrangements in the Indo-Pacific region. The development of networks, security networks in the Indo-Pacific that are concurrent with renewed efforts to keep the US engaged in Asia, that strategic momentum needs to be continued. And the question is, can his successor do this? Another opportunity or threat that we can identify is the opportunity to sustain some level of multilateral cooperation despite the distractions of COVID-19. To continue the trust building, the habits of cooperation and enhancing operational effectiveness, both inside and outside of Japan. In other words, what Prime Minister Abe has called proactive uh, pacifism. This is, again, an opportunity that sits before any successor. Threats include the danger of destabilization of regional states internally, particularly the economic aftermath of COVID has to be included now in strategic planning. And we can see that partly due to COVID, Japan will issue a new national security strategy. But not only that, a new national defence program guideline and a new midterm defence program that will include security planning for future pandemics. Now, the significant thing here is all of this is going to happen in an incredibly compressed time frame, because by the end of September, budget bids have to be in if the normal budget process is going to take place. So to conclude, I know I'm a bit talking a bit too long here. Sorry, Lauren. I think the legacy of Prime Minister Abe in security terms partly comprises the creation of a template for incremental change to Japan's evolution as a constrained but engaged regional power, particularly in defence diplomacy and security network building in the Indo-Pacific. COVID has offered Japan an opportunity to consolidate the normative standing of the self-defence forces at home, particularly in its um, pandemic humanitarian assistance disaster relief roles in 30 out of the 47 um, prefectures in Japan, which is 
what has been happening at the moment. And I think finally, as I just mentioned, COVID has justified an, the issuing of a new national security strategy, which will reveal how Japan's assessment of security challenges in a post-COVID world will shape Japanese security policy, including on force projection, navigating US-China tension, and responding to China's presence in the South China Sea. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ricky. Uh, it was wonderful to get that really nuanced analysis um, of Abe's legacy. And yeah, I think what's, what's really coming through is that there is a strong need for some multilateral cooperation and um, we're getting a lot of questions through about that, um, which we'll come back to. Um, so our next speaker this evening and our final speaker is Tomohiko Satake who is a senior research fellow at the National Institute for Defence Studies in Tokyo. Uh, he was formerly a visiting fellow at the Australia-Japan Research Centre between 2015 and 16, and he also holds a PhD from the ANU and a master's from Keio University. Um, his research focuses on um, alliance politics, Japanese security and Japan's security cooperation uh, with Australia. We're delighted um, that he's going to be presenting tonight. Um, he'll talk more about the, the US-China uh, tensions and how that's impacting on Japan. Thanks, um, Dr. Sake. <laughs> Well, thanks, Lauren, and uh, I'd like to thank AJRC for uh, inviting me to uh, this Japan update. Um, I'm, I'm especially honored to join this panel with other uh, uh, distinguished guests, uh, including uh, my uh, mentor, uh, Professor Soya at Keio University. Now, um, I'd like to discuss how Japan has been searching for uh, greater autonomy, you know, uh, amid the uh, uh, intensifying uh, US Sino rivalry. Uh, especially in this post-pandemic world. Um, so simply put, I think Japan's security environment has been uh, getting worse and worse, you know, uh, especially because of this pandemic. I've been saying that Japan's security environment became uh, bad uh, over the past decade, but this time surely you know, it accelerated this trend because during the pandemic, for example, the, the US military you know, temporarily terminated uh, the overseas uh, deployment. Uh, including some uh, major military exercises with uh, regional allies and partners. And the United States suffered from the largest number of deaths uh, because of these you know, uh, infection diseases. And, and that not only uh, impacted on US soldiers in the homeland, but also US soldiers stationed in Japan. Um, meanwhile, you know, China uh, continued to expand its uh, maritime and air uh, presence uh, in the region surrounding Japan. And just for example, you know, uh, between January and March of this year, uh, Chinese Coast Guard ships navigated in waters uh, contiguous to the Senkaku Islands uh, 289 times, uh, 289 times. And that was a 57% uh, increase uh, from the same period last year. Um, and I, I don't think the U.S. extended the towns so as severely damaged, you know, because of this pandemic. I think U.S. military maintained a, a sufficient level of uh, readiness uh, even during the pandemic. But nonetheless, I think this pandemic uh, created some uh, uh, both psychological and physical uh, gaps uh, uh, in U.S. extended deterrence, uh, which also provided some greater maneuverability uh, for, for the Chinese military to step up their activities uh, uh, in the region. Um, at the same time, Japan's economy is, is hugely you know, affected by this pandemic and uh, you know, disruption of supply chains, one thing, and the Japanese in the, uh, automobile industry, for example, uh, uh, was you know, hurt. Uh, uh, as they have many uh, factories in Wuhan and uh, you know, lockdown of Wuhan in China. Um, also, Japan's uh, tourism industry, uh, especially you know, uh, the one in Hokkaido, for example, uh, has been severely damaged uh, by the sudden decline of uh, Chinese visitors. Um, China's so-called uh, economic coercion, you know, including the control of uh, uh, trade, uh, uh, supply chain, and uh, you know, tourists or you know, visitors from China uh, to some uh, countries, you know, uh, 
also increase some uh, uh, risks of the uh, over dependence on China in terms of economy. I think Japanese people are, are closely watching the recent trade spot between uh, China and Australia um, uh, after Australia has called for uh, independent inquiry of COVID-19 in April this year. So, so, so I think uh, facing this uh, reality, Japan has been searching for a greater uh, autonomy, uh, uh, if not independent, you know, in terms of both security and economic policies. Um, let me take just one example. You know, Japanese policymakers have recently discussed the so-called introduction of the uh, uh, enemy-based strike capabilities, uh, which is called the uh, uh, Tekikichi Ikogeki Inori. And this, you know, striking enemies bases are, uh, uh, is not necessarily like a, a preemptive attack or a preventive, you know, attack against adversaries. Instead, it's like a kind of counter uh, striking capabilities, uh, just in case the adversary try to attack Japan or already, you know, attack Japan. And, and this is nothing new, you know, we've been discussing this issue for many years uh, since uh, the end of the Cold War. But every time uh, we discuss this uh, enemy-based threatening capability, we lead to the uh, same conclusion. Um, that is, you know, it, it doesn't make so much sense for Japan to have this kind of capabilities, uh, as long as uh, we can rely on the uh, US uh, counter-strike uh, capabilities. No. Uh, but this time, uh, the story is a bit different, uh, 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 partly because, you know, uh, North Korea has developed some uh, 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 missile modernization and uh, uh, including the uh, development of ICBM that can reach the US homeland uh, and partly because the uh, US strategic primacy in the region has been uh, uh, increasingly challenged uh, by uh, Chinese uh, military. So, so in order to fill the gap you know, of this US extended deterrence, you know, Japan has tried to adopt a more uh, robust and a more, how to say, self-reliant uh, defense a posture, and that will also strengthen the U.S.-Japan alliance, not weaken, you know, strengthen the U.S.-Japan alliance. So that's a kind of common debate uh, uh, in Japanese security community these days. Um, I think Japan has also tried to reduce its uh, economic dependence on China uh, by uh, diversifying uh, its uh, supply chains. And uh, based on the decision in April, the METI, you know, the Ministry of Economy and Trade and Industry, uh, has already approved uh, 87 projects uh, by Japanese firms uh, to financially you know, support for their diversification of supply chain uh, from, from China to uh, Southeast Asia and, and to Japan as well. But, you know, uh, so, so diversification and the autonomy, these are kind of key phrases to uh, typify uh, Japan's response to uh, COVID-19. Now, um, I think these are kind of uh, natural uh, response by Japan to this uh, crisis. But uh, having said that, I think there are many problem, problem there. And uh, simply put, you know, Japan's quest for autonomy uh, uh, is a kind of long year project. You know, it takes time. And even if Japan can gain long range missiles, for example, uh, Japan uh, continues to rely on the US uh, in terms of the, uh, you know, uh, searching, uh, capturing and uh, destroying those targets. Uh, so without U.S. help, we can't, you know, attack military bases of the enemy and so on. Um, Japan doesn't have any capability to destroy the area uh, defense network of uh, enemies. And Japan also continue to rely on the missile defense system uh, uh, that requires a close uh, cooperation with the U.S. military. Um, and then the same can be said to the uh, economic uh, diversification or economic autonomy. You know, um, it's true that the government tried to finance some Japanese farms uh, to diversify their supply chain uh, overseas. But, you know, these farms will not only e e consider uh, the financial costs, uh, but also calculate various costs and benefits of diversification, uh, such as the uh, market size, the uh, quality of infrastructure, uh, and the labor costs, and so on. So, so I'm not quite sure if uh, these Japanese companies can uh, quickly find some uh, alternative a place to China uh, for their uh, commercial activities. Um, meanwhile, uh, the U.S. Sino rivalry has uh, intensified rapidly, and uh, I think there has been growing risks of the uh, uh, conflict escalation between these two uh, uh, regional giants. And 
Uh, I don't think Japan would maintain some neutrality when conflicts occur between the US and China. Japan and the US allies, so we definitely support the US military. But at the same time, you know, that, that's a kind of nightmare. Uh, the US China conflict is a nightmare for all Japanese uh, policy makers, and perhaps even more a nightmare than the US China rapprochement. You know? And if that's the case, I think Japan should uh, continue to encourage. Uh, some uh, dialogue uh, between the United States and China uh, by taking advantage of uh, a good relationship with both countries. Um, you know, the, the emergence of the so-called new Cold War might be uh, inevitable, but, uh, you know, at least we have to uh, avoid the emergence of hot war uh, between the two countries. Um, I think Japan uh, also should uh, enhance uh, cooperation with uh, uh, regional and uh, maybe uh, extra regional uh, countries or middle powers, you know, to create the so-called third pair, uh, neither China uh, nor the United States. And I think with these middle powers, you know, Japan uh, can reform and uh, revitalize uh, some multilateral institutions such as the uh, United Nations, WHO, and WTO, and so on. And, and, and quite obviously, you know, Australia is the most uh, reliable uh, partner for Japan uh, to take that kind of uh, initiative. Um, I think there are, you know, plenty of things Japan also can cooperate, uh, um, not only, you know, in security area, but also in uh, global healthcare, for example. Um, and it's especially important to strengthen healthcare in some vulnerable uh, regions and countries such as uh, Southeast Asia or uh, South Pacific. And I think both countries have a good quality of uh, uh, skills, know-how, and uh, even the military, you know, in this medical uh, uh, quality. So, so, so I think, you know, there are many things Japan uh, can cooperate in this area. Um, and also, uh, we have to work out to involve other uh, regional and uh, extra regional uh, players, uh, such as uh, India, South Korea, ASEAN, uh, the UK and France, and maybe Germany as well, uh, into these uh, uh, middle power you know, networks. So, so I, hope, I hope this uh, COVID-19 would be a, a good wake up call uh, for all regional middle powers to step up their activities. Okay, um, maybe I stop here and uh, try to respond to some co comment or question. Thank you. Thank you very much, Satake-san. That was a wonderful presentation. And yeah, I really like the idea of this um, middle power cooperation emerging um, from the unfortunate context of the pandemic. Um, as I said, we've had a lot of questions about multilateral cooperation, especially middle power cooperation and the Quad, um, which we'll come back to. So this brings us now to our Q&A session. I've received a lot of fantastic questions, so I'll invite all our panelists to um, come back and join in. Um, I think I'll first ask Professor Sawyer if you'd like to respond to um, Ricky's question about how the ideological aspects of Prime Minister Abe's um, policy may have affected his relations with neighboring countries or Japan's relations with neighboring countries, especially South Korea. And I'll also add to that one of the questions um, from Peter Lee, my colleague um, at ANU, Strategic, uh, Department of Strategic and Defense Studies, who's asked that um, given your expertise about Japan-South Korea relations, what do you think are the prospects for the reconciliation or cooperation under President Moon and the next Japanese PM. Will we have to wait to 2022 to see any real improvement? And I'll come back to his question. That's all for now. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, maybe that's enough. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, I think, uh, uh, you know, Ricky's uh, question and uh, Persili's questions are very much connected. And, uh, <clears throat> well, there are various ways of addressing this question, but uh, I'm still thinking how best to. Uh, as far as, you know, ideological aspect of Prime Minister Abe, uh, at least in his public statement, uh, he, he has not expressed anything like uh, sort of beautifying past history or kind of revising 
the you know post war you know stories or uh, and uh, and he ended up endorsing virtually the Murayama statement and the Kono statement and what he really believes in uh, could be could be different yes of course but as a kind of leader of Japan uh, as it turned out uh, he couldn't express uh, those things and base his policies you know on those what he really believes in and uh, but one thing which he has not considered so beautifying history and so forth has never been part of his you know performance and but one thing which has not which he has not given in uh, is the the point that this game of you know crit criticism and apologies should should end and should not be passed over to the next generation you know this phrase is in his 70th year you know speech on history and this this point is is very strong so putting an end to to this game i think he 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 has very strong point on this and japanese public in general if he had expressed you know some some typical kind of revisionist views about history i mean that would have split the japanese society as well but he hasn't done that but this point about you know putting an end to this you know resonates many japanese feelings of so called you know history fatigue and so forth so th th i think this this kind of you know this was well communicated into the public sentiments but the thing is the, on the part of korea south korea uh, their their baseline is totally the opposite you know uh, there is no such thing as an end you know to to this and why Mr. Abe agreed to the 2013, you know, Comfort Women, you know, agreement? I think this point is most critical because in that agreement there was a, there was an item which says this will be closed, you know, completely and irreversibly. And uh, you know, this this is this is very important, and uh, this is very important for Abe. I think that's why he kind of agreed to to this. But this was a kind of uh, this this was a very courageous thing on the part of uh, President Pakune to do, and as it turned out, you know this united you know huge oppositions in Korea, and which led to eventually President Moon's line of sort of not accepting this agreement, and uh, and that's how the kind of new rounds of you know can. You know, exchanges of words as well as policies, you know, started between Abe administration and the Moon administration. And uh, so I think basically this structure uh, of how uh, history is being seen uh, in Japan and in Korea, almost 180 degrees opposite. I think uh, this is a structural sort of aspect uh, of uh, the relationship between Japan and South Korea and the present moon and the prime minister Abe. and the question as to how things would if emerge uh and the next prime minister can uh, no not sorry uh, suga and uh he, he has not been chosen yet but uh it is almost for sure that everybody takes it for granted and uh, and myself included of course and uh Nobody knows. As, as long as uh, following his, his words, he is saying he will follow the footsteps of Prime Minister Abe, and, uh, and particularly in terms of foreign policy. Uh, Mr. Suga is not a foreign policy person, and I don't think he has any you know, clear kind of framework or ideology or concept as to you know, what Japanese foreign policy ought to be. So my safe bet is he will, you know, try to work, uh, walk, you know, on some tight rope, uh, and without damaging Abe's legacies, uh, but not necessarily, you know, building on the same sort of ideological, uh, you know, uh, kind of beliefs, and uh, 
And so depending on how things evolve and particularly how you know, Korean side would also react, uh, there are s small chances, I think, uh, of improvement. But if things continue, uh, business as usual, maybe the same situation will continue for the time being. And uh, for the time being, being perhaps until the next you know, presidential election of LDP is held one, one year later. And uh, one of the questions asked whether Mr. Abe will remain influential in the course of this you know, uh, evolution in the 12 months. And again, he will not do that openly perhaps, but uh, there will be tacit sort of you know, agreement between Suga and Abe that uh, Mr. Suga is not gonna uh, contradict uh, Mr. Abe. I don't know whether that's going to be called influence or not, uh, but uh, I think that would be, that's up to uh, what I can say now. Yeah. Thank you for the questions. Thank you um, very much, Professor Sawyer. That was, that was great. So I'm now going to move on. I'll, pose, I'll try to combine a couple of the questions again, this time for Satake san, I think. Um, a couple of questions about Japan Australia relations. Um, so one of the questions was that um, obviously um, Prime Minister Morrison um, regarded Abe as a quote, friend and mentor. Um, and they clearly had a very strong interpersonal bond um, and that benefited the relationship quite a lot. Um, so in the post Abe era, um, do you think Australia, Australian diplo diplomacy will lose some of its um, momentum and confidence without um, having a similarly strong friend and mentor in Japan. <laughs> and one other question from Alicia O'Reilly at the Japan Foundation. Um, so you might have heard that, um, well, as you said, we need, we need stronger middle power cooperation, especially between you know, maybe Japan and Australia. Um, but there's been some recent budget cuts to Australia's um, Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, um, and resulting in even a scaled down Australian presence in Tokyo. And, um, you know, so how will this um, maybe affect their ability to um, cooperate? And also we're spending more on defence, but less on diplomacy. So how do you think that will maybe shape the, the relationship, those dynamics between Japan and Australia? Okay, thanks, Lauren. Um, I, I totally agree that Prime Minister Abe uh, uh, contributed to the strong security cooperation between Japan and Australia. He's the one who upgraded this relationship to uh, what is called special you know, strategic partnerships. And uh, you know, he was personally committed to uh, uh, strong Japan Australia relations. You know. um, but I, I don't like the idea to attribute everything to you know, this Prime Minister Abe or his personal uh, factors. You know, uh, when, when it comes to Japan Australia cooperation, you know, for example, uh, actually, you know, this relationship has developed uh, since the early 2000s or, you know, even from the 1990s. Um, and, and, and for it is, you know, uh, another example, but the, uh, uh, you know, this is uh, actually, you know, th this belongs to Prime Minister Abe, of course. Uh, he, he actually announced this concept in August 2016, but even before Abe, you know, Japan tried to encourage a cooperation to uh, India, Australia, and, and also, you know, like in infrastructure development, uh, uh, capacity building, and, and, and you know, uh, development, so on. So, so these are nothing actually new. So what Prime Minister Abe did is, uh, I think, maybe frame uh, in uh, one package under the name of FOIP, uh, which are not necessarily new in terms of Japanese uh, diplomacy. I think it's a kind of gradually evolved, you know, over the past uh, maybe a decade. And if that is the case, I think uh, FOIP uh, will most likely to continue uh, even under the new administration. Um, I'm not sure if the new prime minister use the term FOIP, but uh, you know, something like FOIP will definitely uh, continue as a natural response to uh, uh, this changing uh, geographical uh, reality you know, uh, uh, surrounding Japan. And, and when it comes to budget issues, I agree that, you know, this is a very uh, severe situation. I, I heard that the Japan's physical uh, deficit uh, this year uh, rose to 66.1 trillion yen, you know, 66.1 trillion, which is uh, very huge. And uh, 
Um, Japan has a plan to achieve uh, a primary baron surplus by uh, 2025, but uh, uh, it seems to be unrealistic to achieve this target now. You know, but but I think you know what I'd like to emphasize is it's not only Japan, but also all other countries suffer from this uh, you know uh, budgetary budget difficulties. And if that is the case, maybe we can probably uh, cooperate more uh, in order to cope with this. Uh, 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 financial difficulties. I think we can recall some uh, international cooperation after the uh, Asian financial crisis, you know, for example, or maybe even Breton's system uh, after World War II, for example. Um, but some kind of, you know, multilateral framework uh, of cooperation is necessary uh, for the uh, budgetary, you know, recovery, I think. So, so that's my answer. Thank you very much, um, Tomo, that was great. So I'd just like to um, now turn to Ricky with a couple of questions. Um, first, I have a comment from Dr. Andrew Levides, who's affiliated with uh, Cambridge University, um, good friend of mine. Um, his comment was, I would like to delve a bit deeper into Ricky's framing of Abe's Japan as a defender of the liberal international order while Japan might embrace technological, economic, cultural, and political interconnectedness, uh, there seems always to have been a tension in Tokyo's engagement and embrace of the US-led liberal order. Um, liberal order. Uh, maybe it is in the tensions of Japan's engagement with the US-led international order um, that might provide insights into how conservative politicians in Tokyo might navigate the realignments of international order in the years ahead. Um, so you may want to uh, comment on that or not, but I also have a question um, for Ricky. I know you've talked a lot about this in the media and given some great responses. Um, how should Abe's term be remembered? Um, there seems to be a tension um, between how Japanese um, see his policies. Um, they tend to be focusing on the failures of the, the COVID response and, you know, there's, there's quite a negative domestic legacy, but um, the international um, response to his resignation seems to be reflecting in a, a really overwhelmingly positive way. So um, would you like to comment on that? Kind of difference or those tensions? Mm, gee, there's a lot there. Um, Andrew, I think we could have a lot of um, uh, a lot of conversations over uh, several bottles of wine about this one. Um, talking about the liberal international order tensions uh, that you refer to um, regarding the US-led international order. I think what's very interesting about what uh, Prime Minister Abe's administrations um, have done in this regard is to step in to the uh, places in um, international liberalism and particularly its institutions um, with trade, as I mentioned, the TPP, um, the principle of, of multilateralism as uh, something, something that is to the benefit of uh, all nations uh, rather than exclusive arrangements. Uh, these are the things that strike me about um, Prime Minister Abe's deliberate positioning of Japan as the Guarding, guardian of the liberal international order. Um, TTP, TPP and the um, Free and Open Indo-Pacific Initiative are uh, two very clear examples of this. But um, if we look at um, Prime Minister Abe's uh, diplomatic activism, um, over his seven years and eight, eight months in office, I think we see a commitment to the creation of sub-alliance and additional security partnerships and networks that are not entirely dependent upon the US and the perception that the US is withdrawing from multilateral institutions, and we've seen this is the case. Uh, there are many examples 
of this, including in the realm of climate change, for example, in addition to trade, Japan has stepped in to those areas. And in those respects, I think guardian of the liberal international order is uh, provocative language that I've used to describe what I think is a very deliberate strategy uh, on the part of successive Abe administrations. And that is to firmly align Japan with free trade, rule of law, multilateralism, for lots of reasons, partly because it's clearly in Japan's national interest, partly because it represents such a lovely contrast with, by implication, China, for example, or we might even argue Russia. I could go on and on about this, but I think that uh, would be hogging the airwaves. So in terms of how should Prime Minister Abe be remembered and the discrepancy between domestic and international valuations, I um, answered a question from Donna Weeks um, through the chat about this. I, I think it's perfectly understandable that valuations differ. Um, Prime Minister Abe was very present in the foreign policy sphere in diplomacy, um, often leading from the front, lending his personal weight uh, to initiatives such as FOIP. It would be a thankless task indeed uh, to be a foreign minister in Prime Minister Abe's administrations because somebody else is occupying that space. At home, there are um, other considerations, notably the scandals that continued uh, to bedevil, haunt uh, Prime Minister Abe, uh, including in recent uh, months, um, coming back and coming back again. Scandals that we can't necessarily distance uh, Mr. Suga from. And for that reason alone, I think foreign observers of Japanese politics need to be aware of the domestic climate surrounding any potential successor. And no one was closer to Prime Minister Abe um, during the seven years, eight months, than the Chief Cabinet Secretary, Mr Suga. So if we have a whiff of scandal accompanying Prime Minister Abe on his way out, that same whiff is going to re-enter the room with Mr Suga. Okay, thank you very much, um, Ricky. That was great. Okay, my um, next question will go to um, Professor Sawyer. Um, I think, and this is a question from my good colleague, Ben Ashione at the Crawford School at ANU. And his question is, what is the future um, of the constitutional revision project after the resignation of Prime Minister Abe? Um, will a Suga administration pursue it um, and frame it in ideological terms like Abe? And there was also one other question, which I think is connected. Um, I'm not sure if you touched on this already. Um, please tell me if you did, that um, even though Prime Minister Abe is resigning as Prime Minister, he'll still be involved in politics. To what extent do you think he'll be exerting influence um, over Japanese politics, especially uh, foreign policy? Laurie, I think I touched on the second point, yeah, uh, maybe, in, maybe, in, yeah. maybe indirectly, yeah. uh, not straightforward, <laughs> but the uh, um, honest answer is I don't know. But uh, anyway, uh, there will be indirect influence for sure, but how, how strong and how direct, uh, maybe, maybe not, but how, how do you account for that? Uh, yeah, I still don't know. Well, uh, uh, constitutional revision, <clears throat> Safe bet would be uh, even Prime Minister Abe couldn't do it, so nobody else would be able to do it. So it's not going to happen uh, anytime soon. And but one uh, possible alternative, uh, in a way of development, is the way Prime Minister Abe tried to achieve this was to 
sort of antagonize, you know, pro-constitution liberals and make enemy uh, out of them and increase, you know, supporters for his, for his position. And uh, that didn't work. And I think ultimately elections continue to be important for him because of this ultimate objective, rather ideological objective of Prime Minister Abe. And uh, it didn't work. And I don't believe Mr. Suga would follow the same format, maybe not. Uh, uh, but uh, one alternative uh, possible way is to form a consensus, try to form a consensus across different political you know, sectors in Japan, find a balancing point. And in a way, so far I have not used the term middle power, it's amazing, but uh, I have been advocating Japan's middle power diplomacy. And uh, in the little book that I published already 15 years ago, uh, I argued for the revision of constitution, article nine, but on the basis of the strategy, middle power strategy. And I thought this would be the sort of balancing point, you know, uh, as far as uh, Japan goes. You know, we're following the footsteps of Australia, whether Australia likes it or not, I don't know. Uh, but, uh, you know, so, 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 so my, my argument has long been, you know, I'm for the revision, but how you do it is to, to find a somewhat comfortable consensus, you know, try to build consensus over the years. It's not easy. But uh, the Prime Minister Abe hasn't done that uh, almost at all. And uh, I cannot see any other alternative politicians who, who would, you know, try to do this. So my conclusion would be, it's not gonna happen, you know, anytime soon. But uh, politicians will continue to argue for this. And uh, so did I, so I wanted to respond to some other points, but uh, maybe, maybe later, yeah, if time allows. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, sure, we'll come back. Um, thank you very much. Um, I think I'll next direct a question to Satake-san. Um, a couple of questions. There was a question from Celine Pajon at the French Institute of International uh, Relations. Great to have you uh, in the audience. And her question was regarding FOIP, the free and open Indo-Pacific strategy. Um, how will this FOIP strategy be affected by the COVID crisis? Um, and yeah, basically, what is the future of it um, post ABBA? Do you think it will be continued? And there was also a question about Australia, Japan cooperation with India. How do you think this sort of cooperation um, could help to normalize the, the US-China tensions to the benefit of the, of the region? Um, yeah, I think that sums up the, the question. <laughs> Okay, uh, thank you for uh, great questions uh, from Pajan Um I think the, uh, the COVID-19 uh, made FOIP even more important for Japanese you know, foreign security policy in the world because as I said, Japan's security uh, environment, you know, has been getting more and more worse and uh, uh, well, just, you know, to be frank, uh, I don't think Japan can cope with China in terms of the number of coastal ships, for example, uh, near Senkaku. And, and if that be the case, maybe we need to broaden our scope from this narrow East Asia to broader, you know, uh, Asia Pacific and, and to Indo Pacific so that we can uh, maintain some balance uh, between regional powers uh, 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 with, with other rank minded you know, countries such as Australia and India. So this is a basic idea of FOIP, I think. And then that's why I think it's getting more and more. Uh, important. Um, uh, but budget is one issue, but uh, I agree, you know, that Japan has been suffering from uh, these difficulties, but, you know, there are many things we can do, uh, uh, not in hardware, but in software, you know, uh, uh, like by taking advantage of our, our skills, uh, technologies and innovations and, uh, you know, uh, and also uh, uh, collective self-defense, for example, is still uh, not a full-fledged, you know, one, but uh, maybe we can exercise the full spec collective self-defense in the future. Or constitutional amendment is another good example. So, so there are plenty of things I think Japan can uh, do uh, without uh, increasing the budget. Um, and I, I think regarding the Australia-Japan-India cooperation, yes, I think it's definitely uh, important uh, not only to support the U.S. Uh, continuous uh, 
uh, engagement in the region, but also, as I said, to encourage some some middle class cooperation world, so create some South peer uh, uh, that can take a balance between the U.S. and 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 China. I think what is really important is to uh, enhance some resiliency uh, of regional countries to uh, cope with some future strategic shocks, shocks you know, caused by the U.S. Sino uh, very which uh, increasingly uh, likely. So, so in that respect, you know, I think uh, we have to continue to encourage, you know, uh, this trilateral cooperation, not only in the supply chain thing, but also in many aspects, including trade and security. Great, thank you very much. Um, because we're moving toward the, the end of the seminar, um, there's still quite a lot of questions. I will ask all the panelists if they, if there's any particular questions they want to touch on that they've, they've seen in the chat. Ricky, did you have anything you wanted to pick up? I've been madly typing uh, answers. Uh, oh, great. Wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> there are some, there, there is an anonymous attendee question that's caught my eye. Mm -hmm. um, PM Morrison called uh, PM Abe a friend and a mentor. Mm -hmm. Australia and Japan have successfully formed a strong bond in the post Abe era. Will Australian diplomacy lessen its dynamic? and confidence without a strong friend and a mentor, which is usually expected for the next Japanese prime minister having its back. Well, um, national interest, uh, I think, and logic dictates that in this um, particular geostrategic environment that uh, we share with Japan, both in uh, Asia and in the Indo-Pacific, uh, it continues to make excellent sense for Japan and Australia to cooperate. And this is in no way uh, conditional on which particular individual sits in the prime ministerial chairs in each country. It did matter in 2007 when uh, the security relationship took the major step forward with the joint declaration it mattered that those two individuals made the effort, but it now makes such good strategic sense that it really doesn't matter who is occupying those offices. Great, thank you very much, Ricky. Um, so, Professor Sawyer, did you have any questions that you'd like to pick up? Yes, thank you, maybe two. Uh, one is about uh, apparent paradox in Japan's China approach. Mm -hmm. And uh, on the day of uh, Prime Minister's announcement to resign, a Chinese uh, deputy spokesman of Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, issued a statement saying, in recent years, China-Japan relations has returned to a normal track and achieved a new development. We appraise important endeavors by Prime Minister Abe and wish early recovery of health. And uh, so Chinese attitude toward Japan are also soft. And, uh, and one, maybe two things out of this. One is you know, continuing to face China in an adversarial environment. It is re a really tough thing for maybe any country and for Japan as well. And the more you emphasize, you know, so-called China threat, the more you become dependent on the U.S. because Japan doesn't have any, uh, doesn't have the luxury of, you know, coping with or standing up against Chinese, you know, geopolitical challenge alone. I think which is obvious, and the kind of autonomy which Mr. Satake talked about is being sought on the, on this premise. And uh, and the second thing is, when Chinese approach to Japan is re relatively conciliatory. I cannot think of any single case where Japan rejected this Chinese overtures and the to Japan. And so, so partly this is because of Chinese, you know, move. And China has its own reasons, of course. And maybe thirdly, the related point is China challenges are long, long-term thing. 
I don't think China is getting trying to get back Senkaku Islands anytime soon, but they will never give up. It's going to be a very, very long term gain. And in the course of this long term, you know, relationship, there are ups and downs. And I think these things are happening now. Uh, yeah. And the second point uh, has to do with a uh, question uh, point reminding me of the point raised by Ricky, uh, which is how you know current kind of a phenomena has the historical background in the course of reorientation of Japanese conservative politics in the 1990s and the decade after. I think this is a very good point. And I wanted to mention this partly because this is my next book project. <laughs> and uh, I'm saying this to give pressure on me. <laughs> but the uh, bad news is I, I'm not going to do anytime soon, maybe, if, maybe five, six years later. But um, uh, so my, my fo focal research point now is the 1990s. And many things began to change. And exactly this point about you know, conservatives, rise of conservatism. And uh, there are several dimensions. One which is pertinent in the, uh, in the context of today's discussions is as a result of Japan's rather reconciliatory you know, policies regarding the so-called history problem you know, with South Korea and China, starting from Miyazawa cabinet, you know, Kono statement, and the Hosokawa cabinet, you know, and, uh, and succeeding, you know, and, uh, with South Korea ended with Obuchi Kim Dae-jun reconciliation in 1998. So in the course of this development in the 1990s, particularly with so-called history problems, in my view as a Japanese, I think Japanese government has done a reasonably good job. But as a result of this, there are domestic repercussions from the conservatives who didn't like this reconciliatory approach. And Mr. Abe was already one of the central figures uh, in, in the 1990s on, on that side. And in South Korea, the reverse thing happened. Liberals, South Korean liberals, were saying Japan is not sincere and it's not enough, right? So, so the, in a way, the, as a result of centrist compromise between Seoul and Tokyo, which happened in the 1990s, you know, domestic repercussions came from totally different ideological directions in, in Japan and in South Korea. I think, uh, structurally speaking, we are now seeing the sort of one kind of, you know, uh, peak of this very unfortunate evolution, which started since the 1990s. And the constitutional debate, de debate is another issue. After the so-called Gulf War shock, you know, constitutional revision argument has become more or less acceptable in the Japanese society. And initial arguments have been dominantly internationalist in nature. That is, because of Article 9, Japan cannot be part of, you know, kind of international multilateral efforts to, to deal with post-Cold War, so, you know, uh, turmoils. So origin of constitutional debate, serious constitutional debate about Article 9 was internationalist in my view, which started in the early 1990s but eventually turned to somewhat nationalistic in, in, in the way this is being posed and raised. And uh, this trans transformation also started to begin in the 1990s. So there, there are some other issues, but uh, you know, so reflecting upon the 1990s is very important, intellectually very important in thinking about how we are here now. And so I think Ricky, this, this is a very, very intellectually and otherwise a very, very important point, I agree. Thank you very much. Um, wonderful. So I think it sounds like Professor Soe is going to have a very active retirement and we're all looking forward to that next book. <laughs> um, and just lastly, to finish up, I will just um, pass over to Satake-san and see if he has any final questions he'd like to respond to.
Yeah, just briefly following up uh, Professor Soya's point about the Japan-China relations, I, I, I don't see any uh, paradox uh, between our relations, uh, uh, between Japan and China relations, because, you know, uh, it's true that, you know, we're getting more and more competitive uh, in terms of the uh, security and economic aspects, but at the same time, we are, we are neighbor and the economy is uh, hugely uh, uh, deeply uh, interdependent, so uh, we have to coexist with China anyway. And uh, in order to get along with China, we have to maintain the strong US-Japan alliance and we have to have a good relationship with the, the regional powers uh, to maintain some kind of stable uh, power relations so that we can uh, continue a uh, good uh, con uh, constructive uh, uh, engagement policy to China. So, so I, I don't think Japan is trying to contain China, but we, we can simply try to constrain you know, Chinese behavior. Thank you. Thank you very much, Satake-san. So that brings us to the end of tonight's seminar and also to the Japan update, uh, sadly. Um, it's been wonderful um, having uh, our first online um, Japan update and there's many people um, who were behind this initiative um, and that I'd like to thank. Um, first, I'd like to obviously thank the wonderful panelists um, from tonight. Um, your answers were just wonderful as were your presentations. And I think we all have a much more nuanced understanding now of Prime Minister Abe's legacy and what we can expect um, in Japanese foreign and security policy moving forward. Um, I think we'll, we'll all be um, tracking the, um, those developments very closely. Um, so thank you for joining us tonight. I'd also like to thank my co-organizers, uh, Shiro Armstrong and Ippe Fujiwara, um, who've done a great job in um, putting this update together. And I'd especially like to thank um, the behind the scenes um, helpers we've had, Naomi Oxenham and Mari Armstrong, um, who really carried a huge administrative burden of um, putting this event on. And also special thanks to Tess uh, Harwood at ANU. Um, there have been obviously some silver linings to this pandemic. One has been that by having um, more online events, we can reach a much bigger audience. And I think it's been particularly wonderful having um, having had such a big audience and you can probably uh, sense from the questions we received, it's a real expert audience we have. Um, and it's also given us the idea that perhaps even when we return to the face-to-face -face Japan update, um, where we can bring our panelists to Canberra, um, we're going to think very seriously about whether we can um, continue broadcasting um, internationally via Zoom, the update, and also to receive questions um, from the international audience. I think that would be something really great um, we could take from this. So thank you all. Um, you've been a great audience and um, it's been wonderful to see um, that we've had a consistently strong audience over three days. It may seem like a strange format, but we did it because we were worried that a lot of government officials can't use Zoom during the day at work because of security reasons. So we thought it's better to make it in the evening. And of course we can't do it all evening. So we've broken it up over um, a few days, which I, I think worked really well. Um, so thank you all very much for joining us and look forward to seeing you all at the Japan Update next year. Thank you. <laughs>